Welcome back to another episode of Be A Better Game Dev. In this episode we're going to be talking about pure functions. Now don't turn off the video quite yet. This might seem like an easy and obvious topic, and for some it is. But you will be surprised of how many problems and errors you may be getting because you are making use of pure functions without realizing the ramifications of their use. So in this episode I'm going to be going to explain uh, what a pure and impure function is, how they work, some examples of when you can go wrong, and a little bit of guidance of how you can make sure that you don't have these issues moving forward. So let's check it out. Welcome back. So let's talk a little bit about pure functions and by proxy also impure functions. So over here you can see I have this green box here. This is a pure function. Uh, it is a pure function because it's green, it doesn't have execution pins, and it has the checkbox pure uh, checked here. So this is what a pure function looks like with output, this is what a pure function looks like with inputs and outputs, and as contrast this is an impure function and a custom event, so that's what they look like. They all have the execution pins. So the main difference between a normal function and a pure function is simply just clicking this box, right? So that, that's how you change it to be a pure function. And a pure function is sort of like a contract from the developer promising that nothing inside of this function is going to change any values. It's only going to be reading values. Now, this doesn't actually constrain you as a developer to uh, not change values, but it is highly recommended that you do not change values in a pure function. And I'll demonstrate that down below here. So over here we have a function, a pure function, which will be showing up some widgets when I uh, press this button and will be printing them out. Now inside of this pure function the only thing I'm doing is I have this in uh, variable, it has the value of minus two, I'm adding one to it so it becomes minus one, I save it and then I uh, take it as an output. So now this is not a local variable, this is a global variable inside of this blueprint. So Essentially what's happening here is I'm going to be printing out minus one because that's what it changes to, right? But no. Pure functions get called every time they are connected to a node. Which means that if I run this code now, and I press this key, you can see I get two widgets that appear. One that says minus one and one that says zero. So what is happening here is when this uh, impure function here gets called, it wants to know what its index is. So it goes back here, finds a pure function, runs the pure function to see what is the value. So it changes it from minus two to minus one, and then it sets that as the widget and then moves on. Then we get to this impure function, which again also wants to know its index, goes over here, sees its pure function, calls the pure function, and we get a, a zero value here. And this is the reason why you don't want to have code like this that change values inside of pure functions, because in this case the only thing I'm doing here is actually observing. But it becomes sort of the, the, the slit experiment with light when observing it changes it, right? It's, uh, it, it's not something that you want to have as a behavior that just hooking it up to a print string or something like that will affect the value and therefore might actually give you different results later on, right? So if we were to take this pure function and turn it into an impure function instead and hook it up and do the same code and change nothing else in regards to this, you can see that we will be getting a result that says minus one, minus one, zero, zero, consistently showing the same values in both of these only visual uh, information pieces, right? And that's the most crucial part to understand about uh, pure functions. Pure functions will be called every time they're hooked up to a node and an impure function will store its value from its output as sort of a, like a local variable so the last time it was run that is the value that it will have. So you can use it way further down in the code and, and trust that the value is what you expect it to be. Okay, so now we have the basics covered and we know the differences between the pure and impure functions. Now, um, how can we run into issues with uh, our pure functions now that we know this? Well, uh, for example here, I have put up a event where I have our minus two value here. We're adding one to it and we're saving it as a variable and then we're printing it to the widgets. So in this case, we're 
pressing one, we're getting minus one. If we run it again, we get the the plusing of one essentially each time that we run this, right? But in this case, we are setting this to minus one. And if we want to, for example, afterwards here, add a check that says also, uh, this value we want to check if it's greater or equal to zero. Or in this case, we're just checking if it's less than zero, which is the same. We might be expecting that uh, we are, since we had a, saved a value of minus one here, that we should be getting a output that says that it's less than zero. But what we, what we actually get here is an integer greater or equal to zero. And the reason for this is again that we have a pure function. So in this case, we actually set our value here to be minus one. And then this comparison is being done against the minus one plus one, which turns it to zero and then compares it. So again, we have a situation here where if we wanted to compare against a static local variable like a pure function, we would be getting a proper value. Like, if, for example, if we were to check the integer value that we actually saved here and check that against, we could see that the integer would be below zero because now it's actually changed, looking or comparing against that value for the integer. So it's, it's very easy to see now, I hope, that even though the, the pure functions are uh, easy and, and, and uh, not difficult to wrap your head around. It, it can be quite easily used in such a way that it can create bugs. And I will uh, try to exemplify that with my next example. So in this case, I have an array of classes. I have a 10 different classes in this array, uh, all named after the index that I put them in, so it's easy to see that they're matching up with the index. So in index one, we have a BP underscore zero. In index seven, we have a BP underscore seven and so on, right? So what I'm doing here is pretty simple. Uh, I'm taking my array of classes, I'm doing a random on it, I'm saving the array index, I'm then showing what class there the random brings out, and then I'm showing what kind of array index that this uh, is using. Now this may, may seem like a pretty harmless and straightforward thing, uh, but if you're not thinking about what is actually happening here, you will pretty soon discover that you get some issues. Because checking here, you can see that I get the BP underscore two and index nine. These do not match up. I get nine and one. I get one and nine. I get one and nine, four and one. They don't match up. Well, there is a chance. Since they are 10 classes, it could theoretically match up 10% of the time. But what is essentially happening here is we want to set our array index. So we run the random node on that and we get an index out here. Then we get to the show name notification here and we say we want to print out the class. Now it's going to run the random again because this is also a pure function. So this will randomize something which is 90% of the time going to be a different one than this index. So this is an example of what I think is fairly clear of how this can easily and, and, and sort of slip under the radar, uh, give you errors in your code. So how do you actually solve something like this? Well, uh, I think I had an example somewhere. Yeah, over here. Okay, so <clears throat> what you can do here is one of two things. Essentially, either you get the index from the random and then you read the array of class. Let's take this over here. Uh, classes with that index. That means that you will always get the same result here from this index, right? Because it doesn't change. This one may change, but this one will always be matching with this one. And after that, we're actually um, printing out these values over here, right? Both from the get and from the uh, index that we saved. So if we press our key now, you can see that we get nine and nine, nine and nine, eight and eight, five and five, and so on, right? And you can also do the same but inverse, which is essentially you get the actor class in this case, and then you find which index it exists on, and then you do the same thing. That, that gives you the same result as well. Now it is important to note that 
you will only run the pure function every time a new node is actually hooked up to it. In this case here, I have an example that shows we have a structure of fields, uh, just random things inside of it. And what we're doing is we're printing out every time this function gets called. So we know how often this pure function is being run. And the only thing we're doing here is essentially saying we want to format the text with four different values from this. You might think that, okay, it might run four times, but no, we are calling only one function here, which means that when we actually press the key, we can see that we get one widget that is displayed over here. If we were to add, for example, another print string over here that prints out the vector value again, you'll see that we have two widgets created because the pure function gets run twice. So important to note, uh, it will need a new node to be hooked up to to cause it to run again, which is usually where the problems arise. In the last example here I'm going to show, uh, this will showcase where usually most of the issues arise from having impure functions, which is in the cases of something that's iterating over something else, so like for loops uh, and timelines and things of that nature. Uh, in this case here, I have when I press the one key, I'm essentially saying I want to uh, calculate the position where I want to move my character. I will run a timeline. It will give me an output from zero to one, which I will then lerp on to say I want to move to the move location from my actor's location and set my actor location to be whatever this lerp determines. Now, if I run this code now, you can see that I have my character running forward a bit pretty fast. What you might not have noticed is that that did not work as it should because this lerp or this lerp, this timeline is actually two seconds long and we didn't move for two seconds. What actually happened was we moved much, much faster than two seconds. If I show this again, you can see the point to where we move to where we stop is less than two seconds. What is happening here is that we are lurping between the value that is our actual location, but this one will keep be up to keep being updated as this timeline goes, right? Let's say we move 10% along the way with our first tick here. This means that when we want to lerp next, we get a new value here that says another 10%, let's say. So let's say 0.2. So then it will say, okay, you're supposed to move from 10% along the way to this destination. So essentially just thinking that the the destination is now 90% instead of the 100%, which is technically true from the aspect of like our total speed or total distance traveled, but it's not our origin position that we're supposed to be lurping from. Uh, and as such, this speeds up and gets us to a destination quite quickly. What we want to do in these cases are instead make sure that we have our values that we work against be set before we start. Um, something that is either being called by pure functions, sorry, impure functions, or we are storing the values before we start processing them so that they don't possibly change during the iteration. In this case, I save my start location now here instead of getting it from my control pawn. And I say that I want to lerp from the start location to the move location, which means that this will not change during the iteration. So if I now run this, you can see that I will get a consistent and slow pace for two seconds that transports me forward along the timeline. So yeah, hopefully all this made sense. Uh, pure functions can actually cause a lot of problems in your, your uh, projects. And it, this is not something that says um, avoid them, but rather be wary of how they work and you can probably avoid having some problems that doesn't make sense to you because you think that the code looks fine, right? So yeah, that's going to be all for now. Keep on learning. Take care. A big thank you to all of you who like, comment, subscribe and share my videos or through other means support this channel. You are what makes this channel grow and become a resource for other people to learn from.